Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Sunday, January 13, 2019, and I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And if you would kindly hit the like button, I would really appreciate that too. Okay, so today we're going to talk about moving large stone. And the reason why we're going to talk about it today is because a little background to it here. Um, recently, I joined a group online. I've been looking at it for a long time. It deals with the stone walls of uh, New York and New England and uh, all the effigies and other constructions. It's just a fascinating site. And I love looking at the pictures there. It's just unbelievable, amazing. And unfortunately, I can't tell you about it because I got into a thing with the guy who hosts the thing because... You know, everything was cool, and, you know, they, they, he had mentioned some of the, his subscribers there, had mentioned my videos and everything, and, you know, I posted some comments there, and everything seemed all right, um, until I brought up um, Atlantis, Giants, um, you know, my theories about things, um, and, you know, it just started going back and forth with this guy. It sort of got adolescent on his part, not mine. Um, you know, I was kind of, you know, trying to defend myself mostly, you know, with, you know, he didn't allow to, me to explain myself. So in any case, these people, you know, more or less do not believe that, you know, all the settlers and colonists, you know, built all of these stone walls. They don't believe that. But they believe the mainstream, whatever it is, all up until that point, you know, they're all cool with that, the Bering Strait and, you know, these kind of things that the original peoples are not buying anymore. And, um, you know, they're a little lagging behind, even calling people Native American. I mean, I'm even self-conscious about it and everything, you know, that's our name for it. But in any case, you know, it started going back and forth with this. And the last thing that he sent me, because I had said that I thought these dolmen that, you know, we find here with these huge, you know, what they call glacial erratics, which is ridiculous. You know, you have these pointy stones in the bottom of these things holding these things up. It's identical to those found in, you know, Ireland, et cetera. So, you know. In any case, you know, they believe that the Paleo-Indians, you know, built the stone walls and, and, you know, it may be, I don't know. But um, again, with this argument, you know, where, you know, I got to prove, you know, that, you know, basically what these people say is like, you know, yeah, show me a giant like Dr. Ken Fader, um when I was on the on the radio with uh, that guy, the guy who writes about hoaxes, and after they cut me off and he started to talk, you know, he said, "Well, you know, if you got any proof, you know, or, you know, more like if you got any proof, yeah, well, prove it, you know, okay, there, tough guy, you know, I'll prove it as soon as you prove it, mother effer." Okay, because that was what my video prove it was all about. Because, you know, I said these people don't know, but they, they don't not even proving their point. And I had mentioned this guy who was the head of archaeology in New York State for many, many, many years, did the archaeology here, and we you know, his archaeology stands today, nothing's changed, okay. And he had mentioned in this uh, leaflet put out by New York State that the Paleo-Indian stage refers to the period of occupation by early hunters whose skeletal remains have never been found. Their skeletal remains have never been found. Okay, so... They want me to come up with the giant skeleton, yet what they believe, whatever that is, okay, about the, the Paleo-Indian stage, there's no skeletons from that time period. We don't know what the morphology is, okay? And there's reason to doubt morphology, especially from those time periods, even the woodland period there, where 
these large items are found, these oversized items, and including in this leaflet by Richie that says that there was 14-inch combs, 14-inch combs, large knives and other implements that were too large for a regular person to handle, okay? So, I don't know, but... It seems kind of ridiculous to me that, you know, when you die, you say to your friends, look, put some of the big stuff in my grave with me there, because where I'm going, I'm going to be big, you know, so I'm going to need some big stuff. Throw that stuff in there, will you? You know, it's ridiculous. Nobody's going to do that. You know, again, they, they always make the, um, you know, whoever these people were look stupid or whatever it was. There may be reasons for the, all these things that we're not talking about. So in any case, just to throw that in the face of that and Dr. Ken Fader and this guy from this side or whatever it is, there's no skeletal evidence of the Paleo Indians. So we don't know what their morphology is. And there's reasons, you know, with the giants, which is a bad term, it's come to be a bad thing, and we're gonna, my next video is going to be it, and we're going to clarify my point on that or whatever, but in any case, one of the last things this guy, so when I said, you know, perhaps these large people, whoever they are, I'm not saying giants, and I didn't say giants, you know, although I mentioned giants in there somewhere, but, you know, I started to get, you know, let's think rationally about it anyway, you know, giants could be these eight or nine foot, but like I said, look, I have eyewitness reports, archaeological, all mainstream stuff, you know, that we can relate, but that's next video, so in any case, he sent me this article about how people could move you know, large stone, and I don't have it because he took all my videos off, he took all my comments off the post there, so I can't tell you what it was, but, you know, if that guy is watching this video, I, you know, I've heard a few of those myself, you know, where they see, you know, somebody has, you know, improved some method, or, you know, improved some method of, you know, how the pyramids were built and how they move stone around. Let's take a look at this for a second because I know of a few of them. Let's see how many I know of. Oh, let me see. How did ancient people move heavy blocks of stone? Well, about 22,500,000 results. Okay. All right, let me explain this a little bit more to you, okay? We're going to think about logic now, how logic works and, you know, how critical thinking works, okay? I know I don't have to tell my subscribers about that, but th this is for the people who are not, you know, very knowledgeable in things, so they just, you know, think whatever they want to think without having discretion. Look, Saram said in his book about Atlantis and all that kind of stuff, he said... This is what he said, okay, you let me know if this sounds rational to you or not. You know, he wrote this in the book, The First American, that, you know, I did so many videos on the chapters from his book. And um, this guy, you know, I referred the book to the guy, and he looked up, he looked up the Wikipedia article, because I did all the research on Saram, and he read, like, verbatim, you know, from their hit piece on Saram, you know, he was just a propagandist that worked for the Third Reich, you know, he was just some bum, you know, a dirty Nazi, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I had gone over in a couple of my videos about how, you know, they left a lot of stuff out by Saram. Let me just read about Saram again, okay? We'll read about him a little bit. C.W. Saram, whose real name is Kurt W. Marek, was born in Berlin in 1915. For many years, he was a literary critic, newspaper man, and a prominent figure in the German publishing world, serving as an editor on the daily newspaper Die Welt in Hamburg, as editor-in-chief for the book house of Ernst Rohal Verlag, the publication of God's Graves and Scholars in 1949, 
brought him worldwide fame. This distinguished book won both popular and critical praise. has been translated into 26 languages. says that, you know, 54, he moved to the U.S., he wrote other books, he's living here, and what the Wikipedia left out was all that stuff, and that he was a U.S. prisoner of war for two years, okay? And besides the fact, okay, buddy, all right, if you want to talk about propaganda, let's talk about propaganda, about this book written by an American, okay, the rule book on propaganda. His name was Eddie Bernays, okay, Edward Bernays there, pal. He wrote the rule book on it, not a German, not a Nazi, okay, an American, okay, same with our eugenics programs that the Nazis envied so much, okay, so just keep your trap shut about who's a propagandist and everything, look, Sir Ram's interest was archaeology, and after the war, he decided, you know what, I know all about the sneaky little stupid things that people pull to sort of get around things that they don't want to face up to. So I'm going to write some books on it to set the record straight. And I can do it with authority. Right? Okay, his interest was archaeology. That's why he did and said what he said. Look, look at this. 22 million results, okay, so look, this is like what Mark Twain said, one of the most quoted men in American history, okay, a very smart, smart guy, Mark Twain, Samuel Clements, okay, he said this, all right, follow me, all right, all generalizations are false, including this one, okay, so if you're savvy to logic and philosophy, which are two subjects I've studied quite a bit of, okay, what Twain is, start, is saying is, is that that cannot exist within reality, within our reality. This cannot exist because it is self-canceling, okay? All generalizations are false, including this one. Okay, so what he's saying is, is that there are X unknown a number of generalizations that are false. There are Y, X, you know, Y generalizations that are, are true. A portion of the true and false ones are absolute truths or absolute negatives, okay? And then there's some ones in related areas that goes down, 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 and there's a whole gray area in between, okay? That's how it is. And like this, when you look at this search, how did ancient people move heavy blocks of stone? Well, there's 22 million results, okay? So we can pretty much assume that, you know, a half or two, two-thirds of these are duplications, okay? Then there's a certain amount of them are people's, you know, pet projects on lifting stone. I'm sure you've seen them on uh, YouTube. If you type that in there, you'll come up with all of these ingenious people who have figured out these things. It's amazing, you know, what people have found out here. How did ancient people cut hard stone? 79 million, almost 80 million results, okay? Which one of these should I pick? Okay, this is all mainstream mostly, and then, you know, some people have, have, you know, come up with some ingenious ways that say, this is how they could have done it, and it's true. They might have done it that way, Okay? Uh, it's absolutely, it's totally legitimate. Although this level of constructions at the pyramids and other places on this planet seems to be of a more highly advanced method than some of these primitive methods that people have come up with that are just ingenious, a lot of them. Okay, but you have to look at it this way, logically, like Twain said. All right. Whereas some of these may be actually the way that they did it. That's a possibility. 
Okay, and why I say some is because when you come up to a certain level, it goes through an evolution, like a machine goes through an evolution that makes a certain something or whatever it is. It gets improved upon, improved upon, improved upon. I doubt some of these projects who are with like first time tools, but they were related to old tools that they improved upon or had a higher technology of. You have to consider that possibility that. You know, that these things weren't made with primitive tools and all that kind of stuff. They were made with, you know, highly advanced tools. That's one possibility, but it is possible that they could have used any one of these methods that these people come up with, and there's lots of them that are ingenious. But you also have to think, too, all right, that these people are coming up with original ideas, Ideas that nobody has ever come up with in human history, okay? Because they live now in our time. They have certain knowledge of engineering, whatever it is, okay? All of these could be original ideas and have no relationship to anything people did in the past because they're original ideas, okay? Just because somebody comes up with something and says, well, this is how they could have done it. Yeah, they could have done it that way. Okay. Yeah, may maybe. I don't know. Uh, could be. Let me let me just see this thing for a second. I want to look at this. This is interesting how this, and this is how the mainstream stuff goes. Look, this one. Solved. How ancient Egyptians moved massive pyramid stones. The ancient Egyptians who built the pyramids may have been able to move massive stone blocks across the desert by wetting the sand in front of a contraption built to pull the heavy objects. So they may have been able to move it with water on the ground with some kind of contraption, but it's solved. It's solved. Look, this is not certainty may have been and contraptions, you know, these these statements here do not connote a certainty, okay? So this solved thing is just, it's just another one of these, you know, smart people who have come up with some solution or whatever. This has been going on since the pyramids have been built, okay? So when you say and send me an article that says, you know, this is how they could have moved stone, it's like, look, I've watched so many of these things on YouTube, and like I said, these people are ingenious, you know, they think up all these ways, it's pretty cool how people think up ways to do this, um, but, you know, like I said, it's, a certain number of these methods may have actually been employed by um, these people. Who knows? We don't know until it's been able to prove conclusively. But um, back to Saram and Atlantis and everything, you know, Atlantis said this. He was tell you tell me if this sounds rational to you. He said, look, he said, the chances of us finding Atlantis are pretty slim. That even if we found it, that's what we call it, right? You know, so, you know, who knows what this is. He said that even if we found something, we probably wouldn't recognize it as being Atlantis or whatever it is. He said, but, he said, there's no reason to stop searching for it. That's an interesting thing thing for a man like this, you know, a very well-educated man, and he admonishes us in the books a lot of times about how smart people, very smart people can be led down, you know, the rabbit hole, and, you know, they go all different crazy ways and stuff, but, you know, he's trying to be rational about it. He said, there's no reason to give up looking for Atlantis, because, look, Troy was thought to be a myth, too, and they found that. So, and he didn't live long enough for Gobekli Tepe. So, look, just Gobekli Tepe alone, on its own, being that it's 12,000 years old, changed the whole picture of what ancient man is all about and capable of. And these people are lagging behind. They don't understand the whole picture and all that kind of stuff. But in any case, guys, let me end this over here. It's getting too long anyway. Um, my next video will be on the Giants, but I won't be calling them. I'll be calling them something else because Giants is, 
the minute you say giant, it's just, it's such a pejorative now. It's, it's just connotes, you know, mythical and fantasy things. And it's the use of it from the very beginning, whatever, it, whoever it was or whatever, just was a mistake. And it's not very scientific. And, you know, the scientific names that you could think of, they've already applied to, like, giant apes of the past and whatnot. We're also going to talk about megafauna, too. That has a relationship to the giants, too. Just think about that until our next video here. Think about the megafauna, okay? And how most of the megafauna, you know, before the last ice age, we have counterparts that exist today that are similar to those animals, just smaller in size, okay? And that was only 20,000 years ago, right? So think about that, you know, until our next video and our discussion about the quote-unquote giants or homo gianticus or whatever you want to call it, all right? All right, guys, anyway, till the next time, Budcat7 signing out. Thank you very much. Peace.